I tell you what, we've had a lot. I've been, I've been pastoring for 25 years, uh, more than that now, I think, but my math is bad, so I just round it off. Uh, I, done a lot of baptisms over the years, most of them with Garfield Memorial Church. I have never been a part of a baptism like that this Wednesday with, when Logan got in the water. It was absolutely extraordinary. Uh, and, 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 and y'all, if you've been a part of Garfield before, you know that we cheer and shout and scream whenever someone goes down in the water and comes back up. None of those kids have been part of that before. That was, that was, they didn't, there was no, we're supposed to do this. That just erupted from them through the Holy Spirit. I want to thank, I don't know if Justin's in the room right now or not, but I want to thank him for putting together that amazing video. I look cool in slow motion. That's what I took away from that video. In slow motion, even I look cool. So I should just do that all the time. But we're going to leave. It was so extraordinary. We had eight kids sign up for baptism because kids are kids and communication with parents is sometimes challenging. We only had one young man get in the water. Uh, we're going to leave the pool up this Wednesday, and, uh, and, and we're going to have it up a lot during Kids Club from now on because I think more and more of these kids, I believe more and more of these kids, well, I know they want to get baptized. They told me. And, but when they're that little, I don't do it without talking with their parents first. So, uh, so just keep praying uh, for the Holy Spirit to move and draw all these kids to him and uh, we'll have more and more and more of these baptisms to celebrate and keep yeah absolutely and and keep Logan in your prayers um, I, Logan actually didn't sign up in advance Logan uh, Logan came up to me on Wednesday and said ah I was gonna sign up like last week and I, I wasn't here but I want to get baptized I'm like dude can we can we get a hold of your mom and and ask her and he called his mom on my phone and I talked to her and it was you know she said you know what I was baptized when I was a kid but I don't really go to church and but it's all right with me if Logan gets baptized and 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 I say that to say this I'm so glad grateful for parents um, who say yes to their children being baptized and to say this keep Logan in your prayers because wherever he goes and wherever he is he's he's chosen to be on Jesus's team now which means the opposition's going to be gunning for him so so keep Logan in your prayers all right all right we're going we're, going, we're continuing today on uh, 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 wisecracks <laughs> That's a really good sermon title for our preaching staff and teaching pastors here. <laughs> we do a lot of wisecracks. Uh, uh, and, and we're talking about training in wisdom. This whole series comes out of the book of Proverbs. Super excited about preaching it. And I want to jump into that today. Kind of the key verse for, for all of this. Go ahead and put that, that next one up. Is, is get wisdom, though it costs all you have. Get understanding. It's more important than money. It's more important than position. It's more important than, than academic education. It's more important than uh, who you know. And, and uh, get wisdom. Whatever it takes, get wisdom. But uh, those words from the end of Proverbs that Tanisha read this morning just resounded with me. Uh, and so I wanted to put them up here at the beginning too. I am weary, oh God. I am weary, oh God, and wasting away. Anyone out there... Some weeks it feels like you're just weary and wasting away. Anyone have that besides me? This past week, you know, with all that happened last Saturday and, and uh, uh, you know, I just, I could, I don't know who that dude is, Aggers, you know, I, I don't know other than that place in the Bible. I don't think he's mentioned anywhere else in the Bible. But man, he's my brother in spirit because he's speaking for me. I am weary, oh God. And I am wasting away. Somehow, though, in some way, this business of getting the wisdom of God is, is an answer to that weariness. It's, a, it's an answer to that wasting away. And, and how do we get there? We get there with training. With training. Wisdom is not about academic education. It's not. You can't, if, if you were studying the wisdom of God back in the Bible, today you can get a degree. You can get a, a master's of divinity, you can get a master's of theological studies, a doctorate of ministry, or a, philo a doctor of philosophy, and you PhD. You get all of these degrees in ministry, and you can have every single one of those degrees and still have not an ounce of God's wisdom, because it's not about academic, intellectual understanding. I'm going to take a minute and just, there's lots of different definitions of wisdom. Steve gave us some great ones last week. I'm going to throw up a couple of descriptors here. Um, you know, when we talk about what wisdom is, first of all, and this, I'm, I'm, this is sort of flowery language, but I'm going to break it down a little bit. Experience and competent mastery of life and its various problems. 
That's big, right? I mean, it's experience, so it's not just intellect. You can't just read about it. You can't. Wisdom is not the old dude sitting on a mountain or in an ivory tower somewhere thinking deep thoughts. That's not wisdom. Wisdom is experience and competent mastery. Wisdom is the capacity to not just know and understand, but to live life the way God intended it. And that includes dealing with life and all of its various problems. That's wisdom. That's wisdom. It has to do with a lot of, that, that English word wisdom, it, 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 it captures, it's the word we use to translate both the Greek and Hebrew words for wisdom. It really doesn't capture the full meaning or the full depth of those words. But, you know, we do the best we can and then we explain it. Wisdom has to do with perception. It has to do with understanding. It has to do with skill. But it also has to do with uprightness. That is righteousness. That is being in right relationship with God and others and with honesty. It's not just a matter of intellect, it's also a matter of action, and it's a matter of character. Action rather than thought is the point with wisdom. Action rather than thought. How are we living in relationship to God and others? How are we living in this world? That's what's behind those Greek and Hebrew words that we translate as wisdom. And it's, it's a, it's a, I look, one of my favorite resources is, a, is an old dictionary called Kittle's Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. If you're really bored and need some reading, there's 600 pages of it and dig into it. <laughs> and that's the abridged version. The full version is in Greek and is like 12 books long. I, I, I don't even try that one. But they had like five pages just to define and describe wisdom. I'm going to get to do the, all of that this morning. We're going to stick with about 25 more minutes here, 20 more minutes. But it has to do with action rather than thought, with perception, with understanding, with how we live. All of that then means that if we're talking about training in wisdom and training for wisdom, that's a process of ingraining God's wisdom, God's way, God's understanding, God's truth into our hearts and minds and living. And I have living there, not just lives, because that word, if we say into our lives, that can still feel kind of passive. It's not into our lives like it's something that resides inside of me and just makes me feel warm and good and happy and smart. It has to do with how I'm living how I'm walking it out, how I'm following Jesus day in and day out. We see that in this passage Tanisha read, and I'm going to blow through a few of those verses really quickly here this morning. First of all, in, in chapter 3, verse 1, um, uh, Solomon tells us, Do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. It's, it's a matter of the heart. The heart in the Hebrew, the heart was the center of will. It wasn't just emotions. Emotions were there, but it was also the will and our thoughts. Let it pervade our whole being, it says, and let you keep my commandments. We got to live them out, not just know them. Verse three, do not let loyalty and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Many Jewish folks use what are called phylacteries, and that goes back to a teaching in another part of the Old Testament where, where God gave a similar instruction. Bind these words around your head and on your arms, on your wrists. And, and many Jewish folks literally take words of Scripture, write them down, put them in leather cases, and bind them to their wrists and around their head. They're called phylacteries. I think it's a great way and a great practice and discipline that folks can use to help to remember. But what do we need to remember is that it's about living it out in our daily lives. It's always in our thoughts. It's always a part of the doing of of our hands. It's not just something we know, it's something we practice and live out. Verses 5 and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not rely on your own insights. In all your ways, acknowledge him. All your ways. All your ways. That means it has as much to do with how you treat your children as how you'd use your checkbook. It's got as much to do with how you act towards your co-workers as how you act in church. It has as much to do as how you treat your neighbors as how you treat your friends. I know there's a great, I know Harry Potter's not the Bible, but there's a great line in the Harry Potter books. Uh, uh, one of the characters, Sirius Black, says to Harry and, and Hermione and the other guy, he said, he, he's, he said, if you want to really take the true measure of a person, watch how they treat their inferiors, not their equals. And I don't love that word inferiors, but we all know that, that there is power, levels of power 
in our society and there's some people that we can step on and nobody will care. Nobody will blink an eye. No one will bat an eye. Wisdom has to do with how we treat those folks as much as how we treat the people who can reward us and help us out and give us a raise or a promotion or open the door for better status and privilege and wealth in our society. That's wisdom. That's all of our ways. And verse 9 there, honor the Lord with your substance with the first fruits of all your produce. Solomon wants to make it clear because this last one is about wealth. That substance literally had to do with animals and other valuable property, which was wealth in those days. Solomon's telling us, God, the Spirit of God through Solomon is telling us, wisdom has to do with how we use our resources. However many re- your resources are, however much wealth you have. The books of Luke and Acts, the gospel of Jesus Christ, Luke makes takes particular pains to show how honoring God and following Jesus has as much to do with how we use our wealth and our money as anything else, and maybe more. Wisdom is about how we're living it out in every aspect of our lives. And so training in wisdom needs to be about ingraining that. And let's just talk a little bit about training here. You may not know this. And, and if, you, if you don't know this, there is no reason you won't be surprised. I played basketball in high school. It's true. Yes, I went to a very small school. I actually got, I, I was a varsity letterman in basket, high school basketball for three years. Now, there were 11 people in my graduating class, so you can see the size of the, of the talent pool that we had to deal with. Um, I was not a kid that grew up just playing basketball for fun all the time on the weekends. First of all, I had to go about a quarter of a mile to get to my nearest you know, neighbor that was anywhere close to my age. Uh, and, and, and I wasn't up for walking that far because I wasn't, it just wasn't in me. And when we got together, we played baseball. We didn't play basketball because we didn't have any hard surfaces. It was all grass and stuff. Uh, and, 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 I, and I wasn't going to get at baseball either, don't get me wrong. But I, when I went to my first basketball practice in sixth grade, um, and, and my coach who had played college ball, he knew what he was doing, and, and he had to teach me from the ground up. It was like, you know, when you go in for a layup, if you're, if you're shooting your layup with your right hand, you jump off your left foot. You know how long it took me to learn how to do that? It was It was terrible. It was off. I had to learn a whole new... It was like it was mental work because I had to think about it. It just didn't come naturally to me. It was physical. It was... I had to concentrate and get my body to move the right way. And and I had to do it over and over and over and over again before it became just second nature that whenever I went in for a layup, jump off my left foot, use my right hand. I never got to the jump off your right foot, lose your left hand thing. That was ugly. It was... Well, it's all ugly for me. But it was, you know shooting free throws, taking a jump shot, how you hold your hand, how, where you put your elbow, how you shoot, what you do with your hand. It was all training, and it took practice over and over and over and over again. And I got the mechanics down eventually. The skill was never there for me. The talent was never there for me. Part of it was because, and probably, well, part of it was gene pool. I just don't, I'm not physically coordinated. But the other part of it was I didn't work at it. Outside of practice, I didn't care. I went to practice. I practiced basketball. 100% of my focus went on focusing on practicing basketball. Once I was out of practice, I didn't care. I was doing other stuff. My coach said, take 100 free throws a day. I was like, all right, and didn't. You know, um, I never really got it ingrained because it was just a part-time gig for me. It was something fun to do with my friends after school. I enjoyed the games. I enjoyed the playing. I loved I liked it, but I didn't, you know, live it. Training in wisdom is living it. It's living it. And training in wisdom, if we're going to live it, if we're going to get it ingrained, it requires surrendering our pride and acknowledging our ignorance. That is our foolishness and our need for understanding, for wisdom. This will surprise you even more. At one point when I was in seminary, I was working with, it was a really big church. I was a volunteer. They had their own internal youth basketball league. It was a big church. 
And, and they, they needed a coach. They knew I played in high school. They put me in charge of a bunch of middle schoolers playing basketball. And, and most of those kids were absolutely convinced that they knew far more about basketball than I did. So they never listened to a word I said. We lost most of our games. Partly because I wasn't a good coach and partly because even though I wasn't a good, you know, they wouldn't listen to me anyway. Okay? If we're going to learn, we've got to acknowledge that we need to learn which means acknowledging that we don't know. Acknowledging our foolishness, our ignorance, our need for understanding and wisdom. That's what Solomon was talking about in 5 and 7 when he said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own insight. Don't lean on your own understanding. Don't lean on your own knowledge. The best thing we can say when we go to the Bible to read and study and learn is to begin with, I don't know. Lord, teach me, show me, and all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Don't be wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord. See, the extent to which we are wise in our own eyes, it's inversely proportional. I I learned math better than I learned basketball in high school. And the more you're wise in your own eyes, the less you're going to learn from God. The less you're wise in your own eyes, the more you can learn for God. Period. If your cup's already full, you're not going to add anything more to it. It's only when we know that we don't know that we can begin to learn and be trained in this wisdom. Agur said it more bluntly and more harshly. Surely I am too stupid to be human. I'm, you know, God, I, you know, I don't know what happened in Agar's life, but he reached the point where he said, I don't know nothing. If you get there, praise God. Because when we get there, and I've had those days, sadly I don't live in them. If I could keep that, I'd do a lot better. But I always keep thinking, I got it now, God, we're good, we're okay. You can take your hands off the bike, I can ride on my own. No! If we can live where Agar is, not in a sort of a self-hatred, self-loathing, poor pity for me kind of way, that I'm a worm and not a man, but, but in that sense of God, I just don't know. I don't know enough to be human, much less to be your child. Teach me. Show me. Training in wisdom. Training in wisdom requires surrendering our pride and acknowledging our own ignorance and our own foolishness and our need for understanding. Training in wisdom, though, and this leads to blessings. We've got to be careful with this one. It is so easy in our Western culture, particularly if you've grown up in church traditions that sort of lean toward what we call the prosperity gospel. If you just, you know, first of all, wisdom is not following the rules. Following the rules is following the rules. Wisdom is knowing when to apply what rules and what guidelines and what things in which situations. And you know how that is if you're a parent? You don't, you don't treat your kids exactly the same. Some of them you can give some privileges to and not others. You can trust some with some things and not others. You deal with them individually. You don't treat them exactly the same. Wisdom is learning not to follow the rule. In our Western culture, we're so rule-based and so legalistic. We hear that these things like training for wisdom leads to blessings, and we hear the blessings that I'm about to read, and we think, well, if I just follow the rules, then it'll all work out. Everything will be good. I'll get the blessings. It's not about following the rules to get rewards. It's about living God's way and trusting that our Father in heaven will respond to our faithfulness with blessing. With blessing. What are some of those blessings? Some of them are, they're extraordinary. Some of them are a little embarrassing. Let's run through a few here just in these verses we read today. 3 verse 2, length of days and years of life and abundant welfare. That abundant welfare that translates shalom, often translated peace, but it's peace and welfare and abundance and good relationship. It covers the whole gamut of the blessed life in the kingdom of God. They will give you. Following God's wisdom will give us these things. Verse 4, then you will find favor and high regard in the sight of God and of the people. Verse 8, it will be healing for your flesh and a refreshment for your body. 
Verse 10, then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. And verse five, or 30 verse 5, we didn't read this one earlier. It's after Agur's you know, wailing and lamenting. It says, every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. These are blessings that God offers. He says, if you want to be blessed, if you want to live the blessed life, then live it my way. Live it. Now, it doesn't mean it's all lambs and bunnies and butterflies and candy bars, you know, and, and we're going to get to that in a minute. But training for wisdom leads to blessings. Jesus distilled all of this in, in what we call the Sermon on the Mount, and then also we don't read it as much because it's harder for us as Americans to, to swallow uh, the Sermon on the Plain in Luke, where Jesus said things like, blessed are you. If you're a peacemaker, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are you if when, when people revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for mine. Blessed are you when, you when you let go of your hatred and you're reconciled to your brother. Blessed are you when you live in mutual respect with other human beings instead of exploiting them for your sexual satisfaction. Blessed are you when you forgive others the way God forgives you. And Luke, things like, blessed are the poor, not the poor in spirit. That was the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Plain, Jesus just flat out said, blessed are the poor and woe to you who are rich. There's blessing that comes from this. There's also challenge and heartache and suffering. We'll get to that in a minute, but we can't, we got to remember that if we want the blessing that God has for us, the fullness of the kingdom, we need to be trained in this way of living, not just in intellectual understanding. Wisdom leads to blessing if we're trained in wisdom. And training for wisdom, if you're going to train for wisdom, that means you need a trainer. Now, this is no surprise to anyone, I'm a white dude. It might be a surprise to some of you that I grew up in southeastern Ohio, but I did in Appalachia. I can't hear trainer without thinking of the old dude in the Rocky movies that talked like this, you know, like he'd swallowed 50 pounds of gravel. And I know it's all fiction. I know it's not real. I know there are problems with that movie. But, but I know we need a trainer. I know that as bad as I am at basketball now, I'd be much, much worse if I hadn't had training from my coach. I know that to learn public speaking, I needed training from people who had done it before me, who knew better than I did, who could correct me and guide me and teach me and show me and help me practice it and learn it and live it out in my life. And the exact same thing is true with following Jesus, with living in the wisdom of God. We need a trainer. This is where Agar was crying out, he was crying out, who, is, he was, who do I go to? This is his, his cry for, who can I go to for wisdom? He says, who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind in the hollow of the hand? Who has wrapped up the waters in a garment? Who has established the, all the ends of the earth? What is the person's name? Who can I go to? I know I don't know. Who can I go to? First and foremost, the answer is God. The answer is Jesus, because we know that Jesus has done all of those things. Agar didn't know Jesus hadn't been born yet. He didn't know, but we know, we know it was Jesus. Jesus has ascended to heaven and come down. Jesus has gathered up the wind in the hollow of his hand. Jesus wrapped up the waters in a garment. He, Jesus established all the ends of the earth. His name is Jesus. We're told that it beginning of the gospel of John when John tells us that in the beginning was the word one of the titles descriptions names for Jesus and the word was with God and the word was God and everything nothing has been made that was made I I've got my tongue tied around that sorry everything that has been made there's nothing that has been made that was not made through Jesus he was there when the foundations of the earth were established he was the word by which they were established, the wisdom by which they were established. We go to Jesus. We go to Jesus. He's done all these things. He knows the wisdom, and he will freely train us. And I believe Pastor Steve mentioned that last week. You know, God is not stingy with wisdom. He says, ask for it. I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. 
But we need to go, we need to ask, we need to have that humble spirit of I don't know so that we can receive it and we remain faithful and loyal to him. See, this is the thing about surrender and submission. Those words are not popular words in America. Anywhere in America. Surrender and submission. Well, that's, that sounds like I'm going to be a doormat. That sounds like I'm going to be walked on. That sounds like I'm, 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 I'm just nothing and I'm just lying down and I'm worried. That's not what it's about. Surrender and submission to another human being is, is dangerous and risky. We have to be careful. But with God, with God's surrender and submission, we can do that because we know the depth of the love that he has for us. That he gave his own life, his own son for us. We can trust him. And as Pastor Steve so powerfully pointed out last week, that it's that love for God that, that, that moved God to go beyond just feeling love for us and actually sending Jesus to be our Savior. And part of how Jesus gets us out of these messes is he gives us wisdom so we can get out. You know, they say if you're in a hole, if you're in a hole, the first thing to do is stop digging. Right? Right? And then you got to get help getting out of the hole, and that's part of the wisdom. Is how do we get out of the hole? How do, we, how do we live in a way that we're not constantly connecting with folks that are dragging us back down? How do we live in a way that we're not undercutting our own efforts and dreams and hopes and desires? How do we live? And that's the wisdom. The wisdom that God gives us. But I tell you what, and, and this, don't hear me wrong on this, but we got to hear this. It's not just through the Holy Spirit. It is through the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, when I go, it's a good thing. Because when I go, the Holy Spirit will come and the Spirit of truth will guide you into all truth. But we are not a collection of individuals each listening to the Spirit on our own and doing our own thing. If we, it, we are hopefully all listening to the Spirit on our own and together, but we're not on our own living this stuff out. We also need the church. We need each other. We need other human beings to teach us wisdom. They might be physically older than us, or they might just be older in the faith than us. They might be physically younger than us, but have greater wisdom than us. They might be older than us. It, but the point is we need folks that have gone there before that have that experience, that have themselves learned from the Holy Spirit and learned from the church and can share that wisdom and that way of living with us. We need that. And, and it's, it's risky. And if you've ever been in a church or connected with Christian folks who say, submit to me and I will show you God's way, and then they use you up and abuse you and suck you dry and leave you dead, in spirit, this is a hard teaching to follow. And if you're coming out of that or have been in that, I absolutely understand that, that you will distrust this kind of teaching. And I'm not saying out there, submit to me. And I, I'm saying let us mutually submit to each other to share wisdom with each other, to listen to each other, to hear the wisdom of God, not coming from any one person, but from the body of Christ. Because each member serves a function and has a place and a purpose and is a channel of God's wisdom and grace into the body as a whole. Let us listen. Let us humble. And let us receive. And the other thing we have to do as we do all of this, is we can't hold out for universal support and universal approval. And this, and, and I know the Bible says, the Bible says that, and we just read it, you will have favor with God and humans. That's what it was said of Jesus. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. I've memorized that one in the King James, so that's how it comes out when I say it. But Jesus got crucified. You remember that? That everyone rejected him, crucify him, crucify him. So at some level, when we live with God's wisdom, we, we receive that favor and that approval from other human beings, but there are times when we just don't. And the world rejects us. We should expect that. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, we preach Christ crucified. 
It's a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Here's the thing. God's wisdom sometimes looks like foolishness and stupidity to the rest of the world. And when we live God's way, there will be people around you that will think you are dumb and have lost your mind. And they, will, they, and, and they will tell you that. And then when you don't adjust to how they say you ought to do things, they will reject you. And if you keep persisting in that on some issues, they will actively resist you and persecute you. That's what we can expect because that's what Jesus experienced. That's what his first followers experienced as they carried his gospel and his spirit out into the world and, and the spirit moved ahead of them. That's what they experienced. And we can expect the same thing. Let's, let's just tally up a few things. Uh, put up that, that first uh, chart there, Grant. I, I, uh, you know, the wisdom of the world says might makes right. God's wisdom says one, love one another as I have loved you. The wisdom of the world, go ahead and put the next one up. The wisdom of the world says that wealth provides security and happiness. But Jesus said, blessed are the poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the peacemakers. And woe to you who are rich. You start living that way in this culture, people will tell you how stupid you are. They'll tell you how stupid you are. And then if you suggest, particularly if they're church folks, and you suggest that that's how Jesus teaches you to live, you'll find out what persecution inside the church really looks like, too, if you haven't experienced it already. Let's look at the final one here. Birds of a feather flock together. You ever heard that proverb? Not in the Bible. I, that, that was quoted to me to teach me why black people and white people shouldn't date or get married. Birds of a feather flock together. That's the one that says we got to take care of the United States as an exceptional, unique nation in the world, even if that comes at the cost of other nations and other peoples, and nationalism was used with that. It justified segregation, racial segregation, political segregation, economic segregation, uh, 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 national segregation. Birds of a feather, just hang out with the folks that are like you. That's the way to live, to be comfortable and safe and secure and keep all of those other folks out there and away from you. But the Bible, the God, God's wisdom says that the kingdom of God is filled with people of every tongue, tribe, and nation. And you know, this is why Paul was killed, don't you? Because he not only believed this, he not only taught it, he lived it. He lived it. People could handle all the teaching about Jesus being the Savior. When he said, we need to let the Gentiles in too, that's when they killed him, or tried to. If we're going to follow God's wisdom, we can't hold out for universal approval. It just won't happen. We've got to be willing to be rejected by folks. And sometimes it'll be folks who also claim the name of Jesus. That's pretty heavy stuff. I want to finish with hope here and to say we need, we need to receive this wisdom, whatever it costs. Whatever it costs, we need to receive this wisdom. And I want to, I want to tell you about someone who I know, I've met personally, don't know him well, but uh, Pastor Nathan Adams. Go ahead, and, go ahead and put his picture up there and just leave that up. Pastor Nathan Adams, formerly of Park Hill United Methodist Church in Denver, Colorado. Uh, little, just over a year ago. Remember just over a year ago, we were still sort of, you know, social distancing and everyone had to wear masks and couldn't gather in public places and things like that. Just over a year ago, in, in the suburb of Denver, Park Hill, where Pastor Nathan was pastoring, uh, they decided and he announced on Easter Sunday that they were going to open up their parking lot as a, a place of temporary shelter for homeless folks in the Denver area. They had partnered with a nonprofit organization in Denver that specialized in these kinds of things and, and, and knew where and how and what kind of temporary shelters to get, how to do the whole thing and make it good and safe and all of those kinds of things because, you know, folks couldn't gather the way they'd gathered before. 
and, and, and folks that were in homeless shelters, if you were going to gather in pl- close proximity like many of those shelters are, you're just going to risk getting the disease. And, and if your immune system is already compromised from the various health conditions that many uh, homeless folks have, it's just more and more dangerous for you. And so he announced this. And, and, and he was sued. And the church was sued by residents of Park Hill who flat out said, Flat out said, we didn't live here. We lived here so we could get away from those folks. We lived here so we wouldn't have to walk past homeless people on the way to work or on the way to our cars. One young woman whose picture was in the paper just smiling as she sat on the hood of her new car, her new looking car and saying, I just don't feel safe. I won't feel safe if these homeless people are in my neighborhood. It's a very progressive neighborhood, by the way. I think strongly voted for Biden in the election. Yeah. See, there's a difference between thinking it and living it, right? There's a difference between saying, I believe it, and having it in your backyard, right? And having it affect your life directly, right? And and Pastor Nathan, excuse my language, but it descriptively accurate took hell for this. Now, the lawsuit was dismissed, and the shelter happened, but he still took hell for it, and other folks that supported him. But he lived it out. He led it. He did it. The church did it. That's wisdom. That's wisdom. He chose to live by the wisdom of God rather than the wisdom of human beings. He chose to receive that wisdom rather than the world's wisdom. And God approved, and some, some of the world did. Again, the secular courts dismissed the lawsuit. And it was, it was four people that filed the lawsuit. I have no idea how many, what the percentages were in the neighborhood that were for it and against it. But there were only four that filed the lawsuit. So I, you know, I don't know what the full numbers were. But there was enough opposition to make life tough. Forty people were able to shelter in safety for six months in the parking lot of that church. Because Pastor Nathan and others said, we're we're in training for the world of wisdom. Now here's the last thing. I don't have a slide for this. Running a few minutes over, I want to wrap it up. Is, is, Is this training, this training is on the job training. You can go to seminary, that's cool. That's not training in God's wisdom. You can get lots of knowledge. This is training in wisdom. Training for wisdom is on-the-job training. We do it by living, and we try to live it, and we learn, and we listen, and we grow, and we fall, and we slip, and we stumble, and we get it right, and we get it wrong, and we move, but it's the living it is the training in it. And if we're not living it, we're not in training. I can read every book about basketball there is, watch all the NBA and college hoops there is, and go to every high school game I can get to. But if I'm not playing basketball, I'm not in training. I'm not in training. And the same is true with the wisdom of God and this Christian way of living, of following Jesus. If we're not doing it, we're not doing it. And we'll never get any better at it. we got to be willing to do it badly at first. Everything we're doing is worth doing poorly at first. That's a motto I live by. I heard that a few years ago from a couple young men. Thought it was brilliant. You don't have to get it right the first time. Stumble and fall. You know whatever scolds their, their, their 10-month-old, Oh, you did terrible job walking today. Two steps. What are you talking? Are you killing me? Don't even try again until you can run across the room. We don't do that. And Jesus doesn't either. Walk it, live it, try it, practice it, listen to my spirit, read the scripture, pray, listen to the body. And if you're going to listen to the body, make sure it's a diverse body. Or you just feed each other's ignorance rather than sharing the multifaceted, multicolored, manifold wisdom of God. Receive the wisdom of God. Walk in it. Live it out. Training for wisdom daily life stuff. In Jesus' name, amen.